Lord because he told me to do it this way. <laughs> so I'm going to do it. Uh, although I did it with some degree of, uh, you know, this is not normal for me. I have never done a message like this that I think ever because it's really not going to come out as a message. The Lord gave me this in story form. And I'm going to give you the scripture to go with it at the end. So for, it is all scriptural. It's just what he gave me. And I'm going to explain how it all came about. I know the Lord told me to do this. And he gave it to me, literally. <laughs> so for that reason, I'm just going to do it. And uh, I know this is unusual. But uh, it's Christmas. You know, it's a gift. <laughs> so uh, let's just see, uh, see what the Lord wants to do with it. Okay? Okay. Uh, you know, when we look at Christmas, uh, the beginning of Christmas is most often associated with, uh, with a manger. And, but I think uh, Christmas is uh, really started in the garden. And so, because uh, here we have these two folks who had all, all they could ever want, all they could ever need, including a daily walk with their Creator Father. Yet they were deceived into thinking there was something far better that was missing. So they bought the lie, and they sold their birthright for far less than a bowl of soup. Suddenly they found themselves naked and afraid, full of doubt, suspicion, anger, and fear, just to name a few. This was a far cry from all of the wisdom they were supposedly to gain the great exchange. But their father came bearing gifts that fateful day. And while they hid in fear and shame, he still wanted to take a walk with his beloved new family. But they were so taken with their awareness of nakedness, they were in no mood for a walk. Yet they had always been naked. But due to the gift of innocence, it seemed quite okay to be naked when you have nothing to hide, and indeed it was. So though the Father's desire walk would be delayed, he would not be denied, knowing that their poor efforts at providing a covering could not last, since all leaves robbed of their sustaining vine are sure to wither. He came with a more suitable and permanent covering symbolized in the coat of an innocently slain lamb. And though their sin-stained eyes could not behold the wonder of it, nor could their ears hear his whisper as he said, I've come for you. Though I can't explain it yet, I've come to take your fear from you. <coughs> I've taken care of the thief who stole away your heart, who robbed you of wonder, who told you to run and hide, who said I wasn't enough for you. I have deprived him of his power to harm you. You see, he has nothing in me. He has nothing on me. None of his strategies will work on me. And now by way of my blood-stained gift to you, you are welcome back to my garden. You too can now be free of the enemy's tormenting strategies as you hide within my covering as I make a new heart within you. A heart that won't answer to fear. A heart that will turn in an instant from lying lips. I give you a fresh heart of flesh that responds to me the true shepherd of your soul. So let's get back to our daily stroll. I have so much to tell you, and I'll just start with this. Merry Christmas. And that's the story part of this message. Uh, and I'll tell you how this came about. Uh, there's a lot of truth in that, and I'm going to give you the verses for it. I, I hope that that did the same thing, to know that God would go to this extent to give you an unusual little message. Because <laughs> here's how I had it. I have a friend uh, who came and gave us.
universal story this week and I was not thinking about a message today uh, for today and she just began to talk about something she'd gone through uh, she had actually walked up one day on a robber who was in the process of robbing her house and uh, he wasn't real happy to see her and so he attacked her and took a screwdriver and began trying to stab her which he somehow failed to succeed at uh, he might manage to get a very small scratch on her. But uh, in the midst of that, uh, he ran away. Eventually, because some other people came up, so she was okay. But you can imagine the fear that that created for her. And so, because uh, he'd gotten away, and for all she knew, he'd be back. Uh, so a deputy calls her a few days later and says to her, uh, I just wanted to call you and tell you we got your guy. And due to the court system and things, I can't really tell you how I know we got your guy. But I just called to tell you that uh, I'm going to take your fear away from you. And the second she said that, that's when all of that other stuff that I just read to you came to me. It was just that quick. As soon as she said those words, I heard the Lord say, that's, that's it. That's my Christmas gift to you and to your congregation. Is I want them to know that I came to take their fear away. Fear of failure. Fear of rejection. Fear that your little rebellious self will always get the best of you. That God came to take your fear away. Whatever your fear is. And if you're sitting here, you probably have at least one. And God wants you to know that his gift to you is he came to take that away from you. And what we heard this morning through all of the various testimonies and even what we did in Sunday school is that God is faithful to do what he said he would do. And so if he says that he's coming to take our fear, guess what he does? He takes out fear. And so if you are struggling with that, just know that the victory for that is already won. It's already taken care of. It's not a work. You're a work in process, yes. But his part is a done deal. He did what he said he would do. The other part I found very interesting was that I, I don't usually pay a lot of attention to dreams that I have because most of them are pretty weird. It's like I had too much ice cream or something. <laughs> and some of them just make absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. You have some of those. You know, I just, I, I don't know. I don't know what my head's doing when I'm sleeping. But I also had a dream this week that, that tied all into this. And so I, I'll tell you what the dream was. I had a friend who was digging in my backyard with her bare hands, which I found kind of strange. Uh, and she dug quite a hole in my backyard, which I was wondering how I was going to fill that in. And uh, she looked very agitated and fearful, scared, almost angry with fear. And she said she was looking for some simple item. That part I can't remember. It was either a key or a cup or just something very basic, very simple. And uh, so I remember looking back at Jenny. Of course, Jenny knows everything. So I, I could tell when I looked at Jenny that uh, she knew just what to do, as always. And so we nodded at each other like we knew what to do. And uh, so I said to the, to the friend, I said, well, why don't you just come on in the house? I think what you're looking for is on my kitchen table. And uh, so she quit digging. She came in and... Uh, but she still had that fear, that look in her eye. And so as she came by, I just gave her a real simple little hug. And the second I hugged her, all of her fear uh, just left. She just got released. It was gone. And, uh, and she sat at the table and we had coffee and laughed and cut up. And, uh, and it, it never came back. And then that brought back to mind the verse in, uh, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, that says, there's no fear in love, 
but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected or not matured yet in love. Perfect love just takes out fear, wipes it away. And so that's one of the reasons I've been spending so many weeks trying to shake the core of your belief about your identity. Uh, so that you and I, because I preach to myself as well, by the way, uh, that we would learn to not be so moved by our inadequacies, not be so moved by the weakness and frailty of human nature, but to be more moved by the faithful promise of God that what he says he will do for you, he will do for you. Amen. And what he says he's already done, he really has done. And, and that garment he puts on Adam, that blood-stained garment of a lamb's skin, is his very first promise to Adam that though you have just really blown it, <laughs> blown it more by the, way than, by the way than any of you will ever blow it, because you can't trade all of humanity for a piece of fruit and for a piece of fake wisdom. You can't do that. That's already been done. You can't sell out all of humanity to a lie and cause everybody to be bound up with a sinful nature. You can't do that. Mm. But Adam can, and he did. And yet Adam, in, in the worst of all failures, is met by a God who still wanted to take a walk with him knowing that he had just sold all of humanity into slavery. And God still comes down and says, I want to walk with my boy. You see, God's nature, God's disposition never changed in the midst of failure, in the midst of weakness and sin, and really I could almost boil it down to pure stupidity. And God's nature just didn't, didn't, didn't even flinch came down for his walk because his enduring love for his kids was still there. I'm coming to, I'm coming to get my walk. I mean, that was on God's agenda. And his agenda doesn't change when we fail to hold up our end of the bargain. His agenda is faithful. Always the same. I find that to be amazing. And that he would come with a covering that already suggests, look, I got this. I know you're going to blow it, but I got this. I'm going to cover you in a, in a blood soaked, cleaned off, I'm sure, somewhat, but skin of a lamb. Which says what? Innocence will be slain on your behalf. Innocence will be slain so that you can reclaim your innocence. And you can be covered again. So that it's okay to be naked. It's okay to be naked before God. If you're covered in the blood. Boy, we need to hold on to that. Because I think one of the greatest fears in the church these days is for people to be real. Because when people get real in church, things get messy. Because we are messy people. We look good in here. We all smell good, sound good, look good. But buddy, when you guys and all of us, when we get home and we go about our daily living, we start making a mess somewhere. No way. Or is that just me? Is that just me that deals with things that make me want to say things I ought not to say? Think things I ought not to think. Get my blood pressure up a little bit because you stirred me up with a lie trying to destroy my character. I, am I the only one? I didn't think so. Miss Hayes was about ready to give me a cheerleading back there. I see it. <laughs> see, you know, you look at some of these folks who've been here a while, and they just don't, uh, they don't fool around that line and stuff. They just tell it like it is. God bless them. You know, we, we, we got to learn to walk through life real. Because we have a God that loves us in the midst of our mess. You know, in the midst of my uh, expressions yesterday, 
Wasn't that a real polite way to say that? And God was just waiting on me to calm down. You know, he never, never scolded me. He never told me what a, you know, what a loser I was. He just waited. And then he got my ear. You know, if he gets your heart, he can get your ear. And if you notice that he never gets your ear, you better see where your heart is. Because if he has your heart, he will get your ear no matter what. He'll get that ear. Because the beautiful thing about the new nature he gave us as believers is this. It is when we become his, no matter what goes on around us, one of the greatest desires of our hearts is that he gets our ear. No matter what else happens, we want that. I love it. I don't care if he's correcting me or he's doing whatever he's doing, telling me I'm the best thing since sliced bread. Whichever way that coin is flipping, it's better to hear his voice than it is to have to live outside of him. There's just no, there's no trade-off that's worth that. And by the way, here's your scripture references. Uh, in case you want to check me out and see if my, my message held water. Uh, it's Genesis chapter 2 and 3. I just gave the chapters. I figure if you're going to go to the trouble to look these up, you might as well have a good Bible study and just read the chapters. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12. John chapter 15. John chapter 16. John chapter 14. Can you tell I like John? Uh, Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 11. Those will cover all the main points. Um, I do wish for you a, a genuinely peaceful week and, and holiday that you would not be consumed by what you have yet to do. And that if by chance you don't get it all done, that you'll be okay with that too. And, and that you'll let Jesus be more than just the reason for the season. But that Jesus will be why you get up in the morning. Both the day before Christmas, the day of Christmas, and the day after Christmas. Amen. Every day is Christmas for us folks. Mm -hmm. We may take the lights down and we may quit singing those songs on page 134 and 135, that area of the hymnal. We may put those away for the year. But we never put away Christmas. We unwrap something new every day. If it's nothing more than you got out of bed, you can walk. You unwrap a gift. And you need to enjoy it for what it is. It's a gift. The ability to be forgiven is a gift. The God-given ability you have to forgive others is a gift. So take your gifts and handle them carefully. Be gentle with what's in your hands. If you're willing to be gentle with what's in your hands, God will prosper what he puts in your hands. Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Lord, I love you. Thank you so much for all of your ways, the unorthodox ways, the ways that I find predictable, the ways that I cannot even fathom. Just thank you. Thank you that you have come and you have become our Emmanuel, our God, with us. Thank you that you are here, you are present. Thank you that you are actually in this room right now with us, that you are watching over your word to perform it that it would not come back empty to you, that it would not be without energy, not be without completion and fulfillment. Lord, you always finish what you start. And you have indeed begun a good work in us. And we look forward with anticipation the gift of its completion and the fruit of your spirit that would come off of it. We look forward to that. We thank you, Lord, that we are not short of your embrace in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our iniquity, 
Lord, we are not without your embrace because we are covered. And your blood is ever before the mercy seat, speaking of better things. And I thank you for that, Lord God. Thank you that we are covered and we are secure. And we thank you that you have indeed taken our fear from us. May our gift to you be that we give you our lives. And we let you do with that as you will. And may we be a treasure to you as you are to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.